When managing a patient with an acute exacerbation of asthma, we've got to keep in mind the features of a life-threatening asthma attack. So those are all listed on screen right now. Some of them are observation-based, so a peak expiratory flow rate that's less than 33% of expected, or persistent oxygen saturations of less than 92%. Some of the others are more clinical, so such as altered consciousness, uh, noticing hypertension or an arrhythmia, and uh, certain other uh, examination findings as well, such as cyanosis, poor respiratory effort, and a silent chest. So if any of these features are present, then... It's quite concerning and it means that they require a higher level of care or at the very least need to be reviewed um, by anaesthetists and ITU. So they may need intubation and ventilation. So most asthma attacks will not get to that stage and they will respond uh, to the standard uh, treatments that are offered. So first and foremost, a salbutamol nebulizer uh, will help try and open up those airways and uh, improve their breathing. If that by itself is ineffective, then an ipratropium nebulizer may be used. So that's a short-acting muscarinic antagonist, which, um, similar to salbutamol, will help relax the smooth muscle around the bron bronchi and, uh, and facilitate the, the movement of air in and out. There are a bunch of intravenous agents that could be used as well. So a lot of the time, magnesium is given in severe asthma attacks. Um, it's often the first-line intravenous agent used mainly because it, it has a relatively wide therapeutic window and it doesn't really cause much toxicity. So magnesium is useful in a number of uh, different acute medical circumstances. Everything from you know, asthma attacks to seizures can benefit from magnesium. So it's something that uh, you'll see used quite often in acute medicine. Uh, there's a bunch of other slightly more specialist um, intravenous agents that can also be used, such as aminophilins and salbutamol. Patients should also be started on a steroid, so this may be given in the form of intravenous hydrocortisone if the patient's breathing is so bad that they are probably unable to swallow a tablet. Otherwise, um, usually oral prednisolone for about three to five days uh, will help dampen down the inflammation and reduce the risk of a sort of rebound asthma attack. Regarding the long-term management of asthma, in kids it's a little bit complicated because it depends on whether they're less than five years old or five to 16 years old. Uh, so one point I'd like to make is that quite often uh, people are hesitant to d diagnose asthma in children under the age of five years because, um, because children at that, that age have small airways anyway. So it doesn't take very much um, to make the airways ever so slightly narrower to cause this whistling, uh, rattly, wheezy sound. So a lot of children will wheeze, but most of the time that will be just due to uh, some sort of viral infection. However, if a child seems to be wheezing irrespective of whether they have an, a viral infection or not, um, and especially if they have you know, a strong personal or family history of atopic diseases, then you're more likely to think that it's, uh, it's going to be asthma. So if we first of all focus on the 5 to 16 year group, uh, the first line treatment will be a salbutamol inhaler just to use whenever required. And if that is having to be used quite often and they find that the asthma is poorly controlled, then you'd add in an inhaled corticosteroid. So sometimes if the patient's asthma seems to be bad enough, they may be started on salbutamol and an inhaled corticosteroid right from the get-go. Um, but sometimes they will just be trialed with a Ventolin inhaler. And later on, if that's insufficient, an inhaled corticosteroid, a regular inhaled corticosteroid will be uh, started. If the inhaled corticosteroid is also ineffective at controlling the symptoms, then a leukotriene receptor antagonist such as Montelukast can be added. If that's also ineffective, then a long-acting beta agonist can be added, and the leukotriene receptor antagonist may be stopped at that stage or continued depending on what the perceived response was. The fifth line is something called MART, which stands for Maintenance and Reliever Therapy. So this is when the inhaled corticosteroid and the long-acting beta agonist are combined into a single inhaler, and the patient is advised to use it regularly for maintenance, so two puffs in the morning, two puffs in the evening, for example, but they'll also be advised to take the same inhaler for relief as well. So I think the idea behind it is that you give a little bit of a dose of steroids when someone's uh, asthma seems to be just about to flare up with the hope that it kind of nips it in the bud and prevents it from getting any worse. If that's also ineffective, then oral steroids may be considered. And uh, realistically, around this point, patients will have been referred to secondary care for a specialist opinion.
So if we move over to the under five year group, again, they begin with the salbutamol inhaler. If that's insufficient, then they'll, they'll be trialed uh, for eight weeks on a moderate dose inhaled corticosteroid. Hopefully that settles down their breathing difficulties and it doesn't come back. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing. So if the symptoms recur within four weeks of completing the course of inhaled corticosteroids, then they will basically be given a lower dose inhaled corticosteroid to use long term. So the reason is that um, perhaps only a little bit of steroid is needed to suppress the inflammation. And in kids, especially when they're young and they're growing, um, parents and, and, and physicians tend to be keen to avoid giving lots of steroids where possible. If the symptoms recur more than four weeks after completing this trial, then the moderate dose inhaled corticosteroid can be retrialed for another period of eight weeks. So if we go past the third line option, then it's a case of again trying a leukotriene receptor antagonist. And if that's also insufficient, then specialist advice should be sought. So like I mentioned earlier, kids wheeze for a number of different reasons, and it can be um, a little bit confusing to figure out who has asthma and who just has a, a viral wheeze or perhaps a multiple trigger wheeze. And the reality is that these conditions exist on a spectrum. So a viral induced wheeze, as the name suggests, is when people, uh, when children wheeze only when they have a viral infection going on. So that's very, very common. Multiple trigger wheeze is heading towards the asthma end of the spectrum, and that's when children develop a wheeze due to a number of stimuli. So they, they may develop a wheeze due to infection, but also other things like dust and cold air. And asthma is when kids are wheezing in between viral infections, and that there is also other evidence of allergy as well. So perhaps they had eczema, they have a strong family history of uh, hay fever, food allergies, etc. They've got a fairly strong atopic background, which means that they are likely to actually have asthma. Music